today as we come to the table. This is interesting in light of what their names mean. Now, I encourage you as students of the Bible, when you're doing your Bible study, look up the name meanings. Don't just look up the word meanings, look up the name meanings, because oftentimes in the name meanings, the Holy Spirit will give you extra insight into that. Sodom and Gomorrah is no different, especially in light of how God dealt with them. Sodom means burning, and Gomorrah means submersion. And the Bible says that Sodom and Gomorrah were submerged in brimstone and fire as God destroyed them. And so again, uh, we see probably even prophetically here the Lord using names uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah to describe what their future was going to be. We've all heard of Sodom and Gomorrah, how they sinned and how God destroyed them by raining down fire and burning sulfur on them. Because of God's wrath, not a single living thing survived. But did you know that those cities' fates were already written in their names? Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. In today's message, Pastor Mark explains how the word Sodom means burning and the word Gomorrah means submersion. And eventually, those cities were consumed by fire. Pastor Mark explains how the Holy Spirit can sometimes lead you to the meaning of a name and reveal its fate. God uses names to describe not only a city, but a person as well. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Genesis chapter 10 with today's edition of Come to the table. If you already have your Bible, let's open up to Genesis chapter 10. As we look today at the origin of nations, and we're all going to be covering the entire chapter today, so, but don't worry, I promise we'll have you out on time. We'll be able to cover a lot of territory, as there are a lot of genealogies and a lot of things that we'll read through. But why don't we pray together and ask the Lord just to bless it, and uh, let's lift it up to Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to get into your word. Lord, how exciting it is. And I know that even as we study, Lord, the origin of nations, as we learn things academic and historical, Lord, your word is powerful. It is alive and breathing and sharper than any two-edged sword. And because we know that, God, we know you're going to be working and ministering to hearts. And I ask right now that you would open hearts to receive what you have for us, that you would teach us by your Holy Spirit, and Lord, that you would just minister to your flock. So we thank you, Lord. We look forward to what you're going to do during this time. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, we're going to be looking today at the origin of nations. As we started the Genesis study, one of the things we talked about is Genesis is the book of beginnings. It is the book of origins. When you get in Genesis, you find out that everything that began, began in Genesis. Very obviously, as God created, uh, we see the creation beginning. We see mankind beginning. We see the establishment of governments in Genesis. We see the establishment and the ordination of marriage in Genesis. And so Genesis is known as the book of beginnings or the book of origins. Well, today's no different. Today we look at the origin of the nations. And if you've ever wondered how the nations came into being, you will see that today. And we'll see also that God gives us a direct line from Noah and his three sons to all the nations of the earth. Now note this, we talked about this, but realize the Bible says that after the flood and God restarted with Noah and his three sons, I guess it's the first My Three Sons episode you'd ever see, but when he started with Noah and his three sons, the bottom line is, is that he began from there. And the Bible says that all of the nations of the world came from them. And so again, we talked about the fact that we're all literally related physically or through heredity in some degrees you link back to Noah and then all the way back to Adam but also again we see the linking there in family of God as we come to Jesus Christ as well but again all of the nations of the world coming through Noah and his sons and and now we're going to see the origins of where these nations came from and it's interesting uh, chapter 10 predominantly deals with these genealogies and gives us the lineup But also, you wonder, why in the world do we have genealogies, and what is the purpose of genealogies? Remember, genealogies are there for a number of reasons. One is we have the history that God gives us here as far as the history of the world goes. 
uh, and the settling of the nations, but also it gives a line to follow the promises to the people of God, the nation of Israel, as well as the promise of the Messiah. And so, again, there's a reason for the genealogies being in place. And although we're not going to get to Genesis chapter 11 until next week, uh, we're also going to see that Genesis chapter 10 and chapter 11 are closely linked. They work very well together. As a matter of fact, it probably would be better chronologically and be more accurate if you took chapter 11 and put it before chapter 10. But remember, when God wrote the Bible, he didn't necessarily write it chronologically, and yet our Western mindset works in the chronological order from left to right, and so that can be confusing from time to time. But again, really, 11 should be first because 11 speaks to us about the fact that the nations were dispersed. Chapter 10 talks about the fact, uh, or rather how they were dispersed, whereas chapter 10 talks about the fact they were dispersed. So we're going to see a little bit reversed. We'll see, first of all, the fact that they are where they're dispersed, and then we get to chapter 11, we'll talk about why they were dispersed and how they were dispersed, and We'll actually touch on that a little bit today as we get into this portion in chapter 10. Now, let me say this. We're going to break this up into two main sections. We're going to be looking at the sons of Shem, Ham, and Japheth today and the establishing of nations across the planet, but also we're going to break it up in two main sections. We'll begin by going through the entire chapter and looking at the divisions of the nations, and then we'll finish by looking at a strange character by the name of Nimrod which, by the way, is a type of the Antichrist. And most of you have heard of the Antichrist, either in some form and fashion, whether you grew up in church or not. And we'll talk a little bit about who the Antichrist, the Bible says, will be, not as far as a person and their name, but what he will be like. And then we'll talk about this Nimrod, who is indeed a biblical type of the Antichrist. So with that background, uh, let's jump into chapter 10, verse 1. And we, we start first with the family of Japheth. Notice what it says. This is the genealogy of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and sons were born to them after the flood. So he simply begins by laying the foundation. Here's where we are. We have one family, Noah and his family. Here's his sons, and now we're going to see where they scattered out to populate the earth and to establish the nations. Notice here in verse 2 he says, The sons of Japheth were Gomer, not Pile, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. Now, again here, there are multiple studies among experts on eth what they call ethnology. That is where the ethnic groups come from. Uh, and multiple experts, believers and non-believers, that are quite amazed at the historical accuracy of Genesis chapter 10. And that is, is that those that study Genesis chapter 10 and trace the nations and their origins back down the lines find that Genesis chapter 10 is an exact uh, exactly accurate in directing which way the peoples came from if you follow their origins. Now, we as believers shouldn't be surprised by that, but the unbelieving experts that see that are quite amazed by it. There's one rather famous by the name of, of Albright who doesn't believe in the Lord or the Scriptures, and yet at the same time, he says that Genesis chapter 10 is probably the most accurate, and he says most definitely it is the best document we have on the origin of nations. And from his studies and studying the origin of nations and linking them back, he has found it to be an extremely amazing document. And again, for us, we know that it's more than just a document, God's very word, so it doesn't surprise us. But at the same time, uh, we have been able through these studies of ethnology to trace back these peoples here with an amazing level of accuracy, uh, some of them more accurate than others and, and easy to pinpoint. But the first ones he mentions here, notice Magog. Again, that word should be one that pops out to you. Those of you that know Ezekiel 38 and 39, the Bible says in the last days that Magog will come against the nation of Israel. And so who was involved in Magog? Well, the Scythians, the Slavs, the Russians, the Bulgarians, Bohemians, Poles, Slovaks, and the Croatians. Now, predominantly, it's the Russians that link up with uh, Iran and some other nations, the Bible says in Ezekiel 38 and 39, that will be coming against the nation of Israel. And again, that's yet to come. That's a future prophecy. But we see here the link of Magog to the Russians. We see Madai here, which is the Medes and the Persians. That's what we know of as modern-day Iran and Iraq. So if you wonder what's going on in that region, they come from this particular line, as well as the Afghans and the Kurds. Javan, again, is the Greeks, the Romans, the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese, and the Italians. Tyrus are the Thracians, the Teutons, the Germans, the Scandinavians, the Angles, and the Saxons, which again is where we get a mixture later on of the Anglo-Saxon, the Jutes, and the English peoples. So he goes on in verse 3 and says, The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togarma. Again, Gomer uh, settled north of the Black Sea, probably the uh, Sumerians. Uh, not as Samaria in the sense of the land of Samaria, but Cimmerians actually with a C there. Uh, Ashkenaz, the area of Armenia, and Togarma covers the Balkan states. From these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, 
everyone according to his own language, according to their families, into their nations. Now notice this. It mentions here in verse 5 about the fact that they were separated in their own lands and they were separated among their own languages. Now this is why it would actually be chronologically better to have 11 before 10 because we find out in Genesis chapter 11, verse 7, that God came down in order to scatter the peoples of the world and confused the languages. Now, again, this is not the first time. This is the first time in history we see this, but it's not the last time, rather. Remember when at Pentecost, we see that God came down. It wasn't to confuse the languages. It was to give uh, different speaking languages, different tongues there at Pentecost, and was used as a witness and a testimony to the peoples of the earth that were gathered there in Jerusalem. But again, we see that God, even as he did a supernatural event there at Pentecost, we're going to see in Genesis chapter 11, he does a supernatural event. And this event is not to give, as it were, the gift of tongues. It is simply to give different languages. We would literally say a gift here he gave of different languages to divide the peoples up. And so that's why it says they were divided among their own language. Again, we'll get to that in chapter 11. Uh, and that is why they divided among their own languages. You know, if, if you can imagine if we lived here in Knoxville, and all of a sudden God did something where we all spoke different languages, we would group together. That would be a very natural thing to do. I mean, to be honest with you, I'd rather go to a neighborhood where I can understand the people than a neighborhood that I couldn't. It has nothing to do with uh, a preference other than you want to be able to communicate. And so you can see why this was effective. When God confused the languages, they said they wanted to gather together with people that they knew of like language so they could understand each other. And uh, he used that to divide them up in their families and their different languages, and eventually their different nations as God scattered them and set their boundaries. And so, um, again here, notice he goes on in verse 6, and he says this, Then that, now we get into the family of Ham, after that introduction there. He says, the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Now, again, several names you may recognize here, one or two anyway. Certainly, I would think you recognize Canaan. Uh, but these are the four sons of Ham. Cush means black, literally, and it covers the southernmost peoples of Africa, including the Ethiopians. Uh, Mizraim means land of the cops. Now, this doesn't mean there's a bunch of police cars there with, with lights going. No, it's land of the cops as in C-O-P-T-S. That is the Coptic. When you go to Egypt today, they'll talk about the Coptic peoples and the others. Well, the cops, if you will, Mizraim is where the Egyptians come from, and that covers that region. Put it covers the northern African peoples, such as Libya. That is, now we have the upper part, Cush covering the lower part, Put now covering the upper part. And Canaan, which means lowland, covers the region we call today the land of Israel. And that is where the Canaanites settled. Again, you should be very familiar with that as you go through the Bible and seeing the interaction of Israel and the Canaanites. His descendants included the Phoenicians, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and, of course, the termites. No, not really the termites, but all the other ites. Now, when you think about the ites that go with this, realize when you see all the ites there in the land, when the children of Israel were there and they were having these battles with all these different peoples around them, they were descendants of Canaan. And so that's where we have all the ites from, if you will. And notice verse 7, he says, The sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Ramah, and Sabtika, and the sons of Ramah were Sheba and Dedan. Now we come to another one I want you to take note of. Notice there, Sheba and Dedan. Now why do I want you to take note of that? Sheba and Dedan were the father of what we call modern day Saudi Arabia. So when you see the Saudi Arabia region, they were the first oil tycoons, if you will, to settle in there, although they didn't know they had all that oil under them. But again, that is where the settlers for Saudi Arabia come from is Sheba and Dedan. Well, he goes on here in verse eight. Notice he says, and Cush begot Nimrod and he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, and therefore it is said like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now again, we're not going to slow down right now and talk about Nimrod. This is a particular character that more attention is given to here in the passage, and we'll see in just a moment why more attention is given to him in a passage. Again, because he is a type of the Antichrist, and we'll come back to that at the end to look over who this character was called Nimrod. But notice it says there in verse 10, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, where, where we get Babylon, Erech. Akkad, Kalna, in the land of Shinar. And again, the land of Shinar is that whole region right there. And from that land, he went to Assyria and built Nineveh. Now, again, notice that you should recognize Babel and Nineveh because we know them as the great cities of Babylon and Nineveh. And when I say great, not great in God's eyes, but great in their power and in their fame, if you will, worldwide. But they were both very wicked and rebellious peoples. 
And again, that's going to go right in line with what we're going to see about Nimrod, the one who established and founded them, being the father of these areas. They were traditionally in competition with God and against the people of God. And we see that uh, this Nimrod, who was himself opposed to God, is the one that was used to establish these peoples in that area. Rehoboth, Ur, Calah, and Rezin between Nineveh and Calah, that is the principal city. Mizraim begot Ludim, Anamim, Lehabim, Naphtuhim, Pathruzim, and Kazluhim, from whom came the Philistines and Kaphtarim. Now, again, we want to stop here on this verse for a moment. Why stop here? Well, the Philistines. Again, here's a name that you probably recognize in the Philistines. That is, they were lifelong enemies of the nation of Israel back in the day that they existed. And so we read a lot about the Philistines. Of course, it was the Philistines where we get Goliath and all that goes with that. So it's a very recognizable name here. But they are believed, the Philistines are believed to have settled in the region of Kaftor, or modern Crete, and some say even possibly the Delta region of Egypt. Scholars differ on that one somewhat. Either way, scholars unanimously agree that they were not from the Israel region, but rather moved there later and became enemies of the nation of Israel. Now that's going to be significant in just a moment. Scripture as well tells us, and history, that they were eventually wiped out as a people. We now know historically there are no Philistines. For example, if, how many of you know a Philistine? Are there, by the way, are there any Philistines here today? No Philistines. There's a reason for that. Historically, we know that the Philistines no longer exist. And we know why, because in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 30, God declared that he would completely destroy them as a people because of their sin. And so he said he would destroy even their roots and even their remnant. Now, why did God do this? Again, lest we say that God is unfair, we have to remember that God is very long-suffering, and this was simply because the Philistines refused to repent. God had given them many years to repent, an opportunity to turn from their sin, and they didn't. And as with any people that refuses to repent and their sin goes longer than God's long-suffering, God removes them as a nation. This happens to be one of the cases. The Philistines no longer in existence and removed for that particular reason. Now, why is this interesting in light of what is going on in the Middle East today? This is one that I wanted to point out to you because it has a significance to us today. You know, it never ceases to amaze me how applicable the Bible is to our life today in every aspect. And it's no different in this area. Today, we still have a situation, not with real Philistines, but pertaining to the name Philistine. And you say, where is that, Mark? Well, the word Philistine is where we get the word Palestine or Philistinian, Palestinian. It comes from that word. That is the translation of that word. Uh, into another form. And what makes this interesting is that there are, as we said, no more Philistines yet alive today, but the region there is called Philistinia or Palestine or Palestine. Now, why is that and how did that happen? Why is there an area called Palestine when there's no longer even any Palestinians by heritage and by genetics, so to speak, that is the Philistines? It's not because the Philistine people are claiming to be descendants today or the Palestinian people are claiming to be descendants to the Philistines, it's really more of, a, of an ancient reason and is used for great purpose today politically. And again, we have to know a little bit of history about it. It's interesting. Historically, Israel was not even called Palestine until the second century under Emperor Hadrian. And Emperor Hadrian was a hater of the Jews. We've had lots of those throughout history, have we not? Hadrian was another one, hated the Jewish people, and Hadrian hated them so much, he said, now that I'm in control and I hate you so much, I'm not even going to allow your land to be called Israel anymore. I'm changing the name of it. And it's now officially called Philistia, the land of the Philistines, or what we say today, Palestine, the land of the Palestinians. And basically he did it as a slap in the face uh, of the Jews. And of course, it comes into great use today politically for those in that region. And why is that? Because again, because the Philistines were an ancient people that did not originally settle in that area, but migrated to that area, it's an opportunity to use that name as a stake of claim for the land of Israel. And so understand that when you see Palestine today, there's not really a Palestinian people that exist per se. Now, those people there really exist. And God loves them. And, you know, there's a purpose for them. And God is going to, and God is reaching out to them. But as far as a land called Palestine, it has never really existed other than being created by an emperor by the name of Hadrian. So biblically it's false and historically it's false. But it gives you an idea of the background to it. And again, how it's used today for political reasons to make a stake to the land. Well, after talking about the Philistines, he goes on. Now he moves on to the family of Canaan, which again comes under the line of Ham. Notice he says in verse 15, Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. Now, again, Sidon is where we get modern-day Sidon today, Tyre and Sidon up the coast of uh, Israel there, up the coast on the Mediterranean. You'll see Sidon still there today. That's where their people settled. Heth is where we have the Hittites. The Hittites descended from Heth. And in the Jebusites, the Amorite and the Girgashite, 
the Hivite, the Archite, and the Sinite. Now, Sinite's interesting here. Some of you that see some of the uh, writings in China, you'll see that when they write their names, oftentimes they'll write uh, Sino dash and then something else to do with China. Again, their origins, most scholars believe, link back through the Sinites. And again, that's why you'll find the word Sino or whatever oftentimes associated with the Chinese people. And then verse 18, the Arvidite and the Zemurite, the Hamathite. Afterward, the families of the Canaanites were dispersed, and the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon as you go toward Gerar as far as Gaza. And then as you go toward Sodom and Gomorrah, Admah and Zeboim as far as Latia. Now here's, as we pause in verse 19, here's another couple of names you probably recognize. Again, very well known, the names of Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember, this is the first time we hear of Sodom and Gomorrah in Scripture, which the Bible tells us God destroyed because of their corruption and homosexuality. But this is interesting in light of what their names mean. Now, I encourage you, as students of the Bible, when you're doing your Bible study, look up the name meanings. Don't just look up the word meanings. Look up the name meanings, because oftentimes in the name meanings, the Holy Spirit will give you extra insight into that. Sodom and Gomorrah is no different, especially in light of how God dealt with them. Sodom means burning, and Gomorrah means submersion. And the Bible says that Sodom and Gomorrah were submerged in brimstone and fire as God destroyed them. And so again... Uh, we see probably even prophetically here the Lord using names uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah to describe what their future was going to be. He goes on here in verse 20 and says, These were the sons of Ham according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, and in their nations. Now we have finished with Japheth and Ham, and now we come to the family of Shem here in this last section. Notice it says the family of Shem, verse 21 the, and children were born also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber. Now note that name. If you're an underliner, there's a good one. The brother of Japheth, the elder. Why is that? Because this is where we get the word Hebrew. Eber is the father of the Hebrews, the Ebers, the Hebrews, if you will. And so again, this would be the direct line that comes down from Abraham. And then, of course, works on through the Jewish line. And it's interesting, although we commonly think of the Shemites or the Semites, as the Jews, you've heard the term Semite or anti-Semitic, people that are against the Jewish people. That's where the word comes from, is from Shem. So you have the Semites today, which, you know, Shemites or Semites. But it doesn't just include the Jewish people. It also includes the ancient Assyrians, as well as the ancient Syrians, the Elamites, the Midianites, the Edomites, and even the Arabian tribes uh, come under the Shemitic or Semitic line, if you will. And again, remember, Isaac was a descendant of Abraham, as well as so was Ishmael, and Ishmael being a descendant also is where we have the Arabian tribes, and so you see the link there to the Semitic or Shemitic line, if you will. It goes on there in verse 22 and says, the sons of Shem uh, were Elam, Ashur, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz, Hul, uh, Gether, and Mash. Arphaxad begat Salah, and Salah begat Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, note that, and his brother's name was Joktan. Now here's another verse I want to briefly pause at. And the reason being is, notice it says this Peleg, in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Now what does it mean, in Peleg's days the earth was divided? Thanks for joining us as we come to the table of God's Word with Pastor Mark Kirk. In this series, Pastor Mark is teaching from the book of Genesis. Genesis is a book that covers genealogy, world history, and God's promises. It was written by Moses to those who perhaps needed the reminder of how God came through for His people, no matter what. Do you need this reminder today? We're so glad you decided to join us for this series. There's nothing greater than spending time together at the feet of our Lord. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville. If you're in the Knoxville, Tennessee area, we'd love to see you in person. We have services on Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 9.30 and 11.15 a.m., and Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. If you're interested, go to thewaymedia.net and scroll to the bottom of the page you'll notice a link to Calvary Knoxville. If you can't make it in person, you can find all sorts of messages available at thewaymedia.net. Or you can download these messages too on the Way Media app. Find it at your Apple App Store or Google Play Store. We're about out of time for today's edition, but we want to hear from you. Would you give us a call and let us know what you've been learning from Genesis? 
Our number is 865-609-1385. Once more, that's 865-609-1385. Pastor Mark has more to share with us as we go verse by verse through this book of beginnings. Keep reading so you'll be ready to dig through Genesis the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.